What a thrilling life awaits you. The acquisition of knowledge is a sacred activity. A truly educated man never ceases to learn. The future is in your hands. The outcome is up to you. This BYU devotional address by Elder Ronald A. Rasban was given on February 10th, 2009. We are pleased to have Elder Ronald A. Rasband with us today. Elder Rasband was named a member of the First Quorum of the Seventy on April 1st, 2000, and currently serves as a member of the Presidency of the Seventy and as Area Supervisor for the Utah North, Utah Salt Lake City, and Utah South areas. Elder Rasband attended the University of Utah, and in 1995, Utah Valley State College awarded him an honorary doctorate of business and commerce. He served as a full-time missionary in the Eastern States Mission and presided over the New York, New York North Mission from 1996 to 1999. Elder Rasband and his wife, Melanie Twitchell Rasband, have five children and 16 grandchildren. Once again, Elder Rasband, we welcome you to Brigham Young University. Good morning, <clears throat> and thank you, dear President Samuelson, for that warm and friendly introduction. Sister Rasband and I are deeply honored to be here today and participate in this devotional. We are grateful to have had all five of our own children and some of their spouses attend Brigham Young University and are pleased to have several of them, as well as other members of our extended family and dear friends, here with us in the audience today. 2009 will be a historic year for the Church in Utah as we participate in the cultural events, open houses, and dedications of the Draper, Utah, and Ochre Mountain, Utah temples up in the Salt Lake Valley. <clears throat> These significant events are wonderful reminders and opportunities for us to inspire and strengthen each other in our personal commitment to attend the temple and worship there on a regular basis. As we gather here this morning on the campus of Brigham Young University, thousands of members and many of those not of our faith are walking through the Draper, Utah Temple as the open house is underway for an eight-week period prior to the dedication. Obviously, there is an extremely high interest among our members and friends to walk through this beautiful new temple and experience the beauty, spirit, and inspiration that comes with such a visit. This is the first temple open house in the Salt Lake Valley since 1981 when the Jordan River Temple had an open house and was dedicated. The Draper Utah Temple will be the 12th temple to be dedicated in the state of Utah, the third in the Salt Lake Valley, and the 129th in the Church. During the open house period, over one million tickets have been requested and given out for the eight-week public open house. I have had the personal privilege of taking the media, interfaith groups, government officials, and my own dear family through this beautiful new temple. As I have taken guests through the spacious baptistry, beautiful ordinance rooms, the holy celestial room, and sacred ceiling, ceiling rooms, I can tell you without any reservation that the Spirit of the Lord is already in this temple and leaves a deep and wonderful impression on all those who will visit. For those of you who have not made plans to visit the Draper Temple, I would invite you to do so today. You can still make reservations through the LDS Church website and enjoy a wonderful opportunity with your friends and family in this most special and sacred place on earth, the House of the Lord. On Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, March 20th through 22nd, the Draper Temple will be formally dedicated by President Thomas S. Monson. Saints in the area served by the new temple will attend 12 dedicatory sessions and the temple will serve approximately 60,000 members of the Church in Draper, Sandy, and surrounding neighborhoods. Additionally, the First Presidency recently announced the dates for the new Ochre Mountain, Utah Temple, open house and its dedication. 
For the open house, the dates are beginning on June 1st for eight weeks, and the dedication will be August 14th through the 16th. If you miss the Draper Temple, plan to visit the Ochre Mountain Temple open house. Temples are houses of the Lord where our Savior's teachings are reaffirmed through sacred ordinances, such as marriage that unites families for all eternity. Dear Sister Rasband, who's here with me today, and I were sealed in the Salt Lake Temple on September 4, 1973, by her granduncle, Elder LeGrand Richards. On that occasion, Elder Richard, speaking to his niece, Sister Rasband, handed her the marriage certificate and said, Melanie, here is the deed to your new property, meaning me. <laughs> and I have been safely in her watch care ever since. Years ago, at the Logan Temple Cornerstone Ceremony in 1877, President George Q. Cannon said this, Every foundation stone that is laid for a temple and every temple completed lessens the power of Satan on the earth and increases the power of God and godliness, moves the heavens in mighty power in our behalf, invokes and calls down upon us the blessings of eternal gods and those who reside in their presence. Certainly in a day and time like we live in, the importance of every temple built and dedicated to the Lord cannot be overstated. Concerning temple building, Brigham Young said in the early days of this work in Utah, to accomplish this work, there will have to be not only one temple, but thousands of them, and thousands and tens of thousands of men and women who will go into these temples and officiate for people who have lived as far back as the Lord shall reveal. Brigham Young also said, For we never began to build a temple without the bells of hell beginning to ring. I want to hear them ring again. Many years later, another of our Latter-day Prophets spoke of the importance of temple building. In 1980, President Ezra Taft Benson said this about temples. Our predecessors have prophesied that temples will dot the landscape of North and South America, the Isles of the Pacific, Europe, and elsewhere. If this redemptive work is to be done on the scale it must be, hundreds of temples will be needed. At the time President Benson gave this message, there were 19 temples operating in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. As President Gordon B. Hinckley became our dear prophet in 1995, Early in his ministry, he said this about his desire to see temples built and taken closer to the Latter-day Saints. I have in my heart a great burning desire, my brothers and sisters, to make it possible to have a temple where every faithful Latter-day Saint can come and receive his or her temple blessings and have opportunity to extend those blessings to his or her forebears. When President Hinckley gave this message, there were 47 temples operating in the Church. I would suggest that one of the great legacies of President Gordon B. Hinckley will be the many temples built during his presidency. During his almost 13 years as our prophet, there were 77 additional temples built and dedicated. Now, now I ask you all, my dear brothers and sisters, to what end and what purpose is all of this focus and emphasis on temple building? How does it apply to you at this stage of your life? As we consider this together, I am reminded of a passage of Scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 52, which reads, And again, I will give unto you a pattern in all things, that ye may not be deceived, for Satan is abroad in the land, and he goeth forth, deceiving the nations. I would recommend to you today that temple worship is an important pattern for each of you to set, individually and as families, as you consider your own areas of focus and attention, as you put in place firm foundations in your life. 
I know many of you already do this, and for that we are most grateful to you. Let us ponder together for a few moments some of the doctrine that has been revealed to us concerning temple worship. We know as Latter-day Saints that temple and family history work is one great work. We refer to the feelings that we can have in seeking out our departed ancestors as having the spirit of Elijah. President James E. Faust has said this about this work. Searching for our kindred dead isn't just a hobby. It is a fundamental responsibility for all of the members of the Church. We believe that life continues after death and that all will be resurrected. We believe that families may continue in the next life if they have kept the special covenants made in one of the sacred temples under the authority of God. We believe that our deceased ancestors can also be eternally united with their families when we make covenants in their behalf in the temples. Our deceased forebears may accept these covenants if they choose to do so in the spirit world. A significant and wondrous prophecy was spoken by God to the ancient prophet Malachi some 400 years before the coming of Jesus Christ. Found in Malachi chapter 4, we read, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Once again in this dispensation, the Lord has spoken through his heavenly messenger Moroni to the prophet Joseph Smith. Joseph records on the evening of September 21, 1823, in his father's home, While I was thus in the act of calling upon God, I discovered a light appearing in my room, which continued to increase until the room was lighter than at noonday, when immediately a personage appeared at my bedside, standing in the air, for his feet did not touch the floor. He called me by name and said unto me that he was a messenger sent from the presence of God to me, and that his name was Moroni. The importance of this experience was emphasized by Moroni appearing four times and repeating the same message each time with some additions. From that experience, Joseph records a portion of that as revelation, recorded in the second section of the Doctrine and Covenants, the first chronological section received, Behold, I will reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers, and the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. If it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. When and where was this prophecy to be fulfilled? It had been over 2,200 years since this prophecy was first spoken by Malachi. Direction came to Joseph Smith from the Lord, instructing him to build the first temple in this dispensation at Kirtland. After this temple was built out of the poverty of the saints, the Lord came shortly after its dedication and accepted it. At that glorious time, other heavenly manifestations also took place, including the fulfillment of the prophecy first found in Malachi. Now from the 110th section of the Doctrine and Covenants received in 1836, we read, After this vision had closed, another great and glorious vision burst upon us. For Elijah the prophet, who was taken to heaven without tasting death, stood before us and said, Behold, the time, which, the time has fully come, which was spoken by the mouth of Malachi, testifying that he, Elijah, should be sent before the great and dreadful day of the Lord come, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, lest the whole earth be smitten with the curse. Therefore, the keys of this dispensation are committed into your hands. And by this ye may know that the great and dreadful day of the Lord is near, even at the doors. 
since that remarkable day in 1836 through a continuation of the priesthood authority given to the prophet Joseph, that power has been on the earth through prophets, seers, and revelators. We are so privileged to have President Thomas S. Monson as, as our prophet today. He holds that same priesthood authority which was given by Elijah to the prophet Joseph in 1836. This is known as the sealing authority of God by which we perform the sacred work in the temples today. Let us ponder the importance of that experience at Kirtland and the sealing authority of God for each of us gathered here. This is stressed by the prophet Joseph Smith when he declared, the greatest responsibility in this world that God has laid upon us is to seek after our dead. Those saints who neglect it in behalf of their deceased relatives do it at the peril of their own salvation. The First Presidency has issued an invitation to all the members of the Church, which certainly applies to you and me. Where time and circumstances permit, members are encouraged to replace some leisure activities with temple service. All of the ordinances which take place in the house of the Lord become expressions of our belief in that fundamental and basic doctrine of the immortality of the human soul. As we redouble our efforts and our faithfulness in going to the temple, <clears throat> the Lord will bless us. As we, my young friends, consider righteous patterns that we want to establish in our lives, we would all be well to continue remembering this admonition from the First Presidency. May we also consider the promised blessing by prophets, seers, and revelators as we faithfully attend the temple. I would like to share a few of these promised blessings for our faithful service. First, from President Hinckley these promises. I would hope that we might go to the house of the Lord a little more frequently. I encourage you to take great, greater advantage of this blessed privilege. It will refine your natures. It will peel off the selfish shell in which most of us live. It will literally bring a sanctifying element into our lives and make us better men and better women. And. If there were more temple work done in the Church, there would be less selfishness, less of contention, less of demeaning others. The whole of the Church would be increasingly lifted to greater heights of spirituality, love for one another, and obedience to the commandments of God. Now a quote from President James E. Faust. We unavoidably stand in so many unholy places and are subjected to so much that is vulgar, profane, and destructive of the Spirit of the Lord that I encourage our saints all over the world, wherever possible, to strive to stand more often in holy places. Our most holy places are our sacred temples. Within them is a feeling of sacred comfort. And from President Thomas S. Monson, this promise. Come to the temple and place your burdens before the Lord, and you will be filled with a new spirit and confidence in the future. Trust in the Lord, and if you do, He will hold you and cradle you and lead you step by step along that pathway that leads to the celestial kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, another comforting blessing of temple worship is the assurance of protection and peace from the storm that is upon us in our day. I think of a promise given in the Book of Mormon through Ammon in the Book of Alma, speaking of where members will be gathered into the garners or temples of the Lord. We read this in Alma chapter 26. Yea, they shall not be beaten down by the storm at the last day. Yea, neither shall they be harrowed up by the whirlwinds. But when the storm cometh, they shall be gathered together in their place that the storm cannot penetrate to them. Yea, neither shall they be driven with fierce winds, whithersoever the enemy listeth to carry them. I bear my testimony, brothers and sisters, that one of the safest places that Heavenly Father has established for the gathering of His people 
is in the temples of the Lord. I invite you to the Draper Utah Temple Open House or the Ochre Mountain Utah Temple Open House, which will follow this summer, to experience anew the feeling that you receive in these temples of the Lord. But far more importantly, I invite you, as has the First Presidency, to make temple worship a pattern in your life. Most all of you in this congregation can participate in the temple in one way or another. Most all of you can perform baptisms for the dead. Many of you who are, who are endowed can perform washings and anointings, endowments, sealings, first for yourselves and then for others living on the other side of the veil who are waiting for you and me to serve as proxies for them in this great redemptive work. President Hinckley taught, now I would like to submit to you that when all is said and done, the work and mission of the church is to save. It is just that simple and just that profound, to save people. That is the whole purpose of what we're doing. That is why we have home teachers. That is why we have visiting teachers. That is why we have classes. That is why we have sacrament meeting. And that is why we build temples to save the living and the dead. That is our work. The statement on the outside facade of every temple reads this, holiness to the Lord, the house of the Lord. I testify that all of the temples are the, of the Lord are his sanctuaries here upon the earth. I invite all of you to attend more frequently as your circumstances permit and claim your blessings, protections, and promises that have been made to you by prophets of God. Jesus Christ lives. This is his church. This service in temples is rolling forward throughout the earth as prophets throughout the ages have seen in vision and prophecy to bless the lives of the Latter-day Saints and carry out the work of redeeming the dead. I know that President Thomas S. Monson is God's prophet upon the earth today and holds the sealing power of God, the same authority that was given to the prophet Joseph by Elijah in the Kirtland Temple. It is by that authority that new families are created and sealed together for time and all eternity, so unlike that which is done out in the world relative to the divine institution of marriage. I pray the Lord will bless each of us here today with a greater desire and greater intent to hearken unto the words of the living prophets and attend the temple. I leave my testimony and reaffirm all of these prophetic blessings to each one of you today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. For more information on this Brigham Young University devotional, visit byub.org. This BYU devotional address by Elder Ronald A. Rasband was given on February 10, 2009. 